When Fire Emblem Engage was announced in late 2022, I very quickly dismissed it as something I wouldn't be interested in. I completely skipped free houses, and this just appeared to be an anniversary game for a series I hadn't been that invested in recently. But when the game was released, I started to see more footage of it from fans, and it won me over. The aesthetic grew on me, the characters seemed fun, and I started to miss a Fire Emblem gameplay I hadn't indulged in for over half a decade. Now, call me shallow, but what actually spurred me to play the game was finding out how this entry was tackling the romance mechanic, which had been a staple of the series since Awakening. While Engage hasn't really made any headlines for this aspect of the gameplay, at least from what I've seen, it now stands as a landmark for queer representation in a Nintendo-published game. So, once I finished Engage, I was ready to talk about how the queer representation in the franchise has been leading up to this in a very clear trajectory, but when I started to research it, this just wasn't the case. So, I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss the romance in Fire Emblem Engage, how it relates to the mixed quality of representation in the series leading up to it, and where this now stands as a game published by Nintendo, a company known for its very murky history when it comes to queer representation. With Engage, Fire Emblem has done something I've been begging it to do since I started playing, and essentially just flicked the gay switch. In Engage, none of the romantic roots in the game are gender locked, so whether you choose to play as male or female Alea, you can romance them and get the same experience. In prior entries, you could have an almost identical experience interacting with a character as someone playing as the opposite gender, but unless the character you're romancing was specifically assigned to be same-sex attracted, you were locked from getting that final confirmation of romance. This had infuriated me, because it always felt so menial. Why am I locked out of the ending of an identical experience just because I chose to play as a certain gender at the start of the game? It felt like I was ranting to a brick wall when complaining about this artificial exclusivity. So, seeing it be fixed and engaged was cathartic, but it also stings to see they kind of just had the power to do it all along. However, I'm not going to bite the hand that is finally feeding me. This is a reason to celebrate, but this change has also come with a few caveats. The most noticeable change is that this inclusion was made easy since this game has noticeably stepped back from the romantic aspect of Fire Emblem. The only character who can participate in romance in Engage is the main character. So, even when side characters' relationships with each other seem like they could go somewhere deeper, this never happens. On top of this, a lot of players have also critiqued Engage for making the romance a bit tamer than previous offerings. Before release, it was confirmed that only 8 male and 8 female characters would actually be romantic options, and the rest of them would just be platonic. And even those romantic ones are a bit more held back than they were in previous games. So I think, the best way to assess the validity of these statements is to look through every s rank conversation and engage and put them into a tier ranking to judge how steamy things do or don't get. Before getting into this, a couple of disclaimers. Of course, spoilers for all of the s rank conversations in Engage. I won't go into too many details, but I will be showing the unique art you get for each, and some characters being playable can be a spoiler in itself. Also, I'm rating these based on the English script for the voice acting in Engage. I'm aware there are some pretty significant differences with the Japanese script, however, for the sake of efficiency, I'm keeping it to the version of the game I had access to. But, if you think you have some interesting information about the difference in localization, I would love to see it in the comments. And of course, this is all subjective. For the sake of pacing and utility, I've split the tier list between the male and female characters. So if you only care about certain characters, then you can skip to the section that you care about. But either way, I'll go through the tiers when I get to them. And of course, the scenes I used for reference were the gay and lesbian versions for the full engage experience. Working from non-romantic up, we'll start with the platonic tier. For male characters, this includes the, uh, thank god, two young characters, and the, not to be ageist, two old characters. This includes Vander, Clan, Jean, and Linden. These mostly boil down to the standard S-rank platonic commitment. Vander and Clan essentially dedicate themselves to working in their roles for you for the rest of their lives, while Jean decides he'll be your personal physician who you can always rely on. I actually enjoyed Linden's the most, I didn't get to see too much of him in my playthrough since I only used him in the stage where you get him, and I'm sad I missed out on this goofy old man. He essentially starts experimenting and doing magic on the ring as soon as you give it to him, and then he gets angry when he realises you're giving it to someone so old. It's actually a really sweet interaction and a great representation of the heartfelt but comedic side of Engage I enjoyed so much. The only character who seemed to not really reciprocate Elia's feelings is Amber. Elia seemed to be genuinely feeling romantic, but it mostly goes over Amber's head. It is still really sweet, and Elia doesn't seem to be too upset. However, this is definitely one of the funnier and not really romantic S ranks. 
Now, for the opposite, Rosado is shown to be obsessed with cute things, and essentially thinks it's the most important aspect of life. In his S rank, we see him admit to Aaliyah being the cutest thing in his life, this being the first time he has ever called anything cuter than himself. Aaliyah has the bizarre response of saying, that deserves a like. What does that even mean? I did all of the conversations with Rosado, did I miss something? It just feels like there's some reference going over my head. Either way, it was kind of bizarre, and I was left feeling quite bad for Rosado. Now for the characters who could be read as romantic if you wanted to, but if you're not really looking, you probably won't see it. This tier contains Diamant and Zelkov, with Figado right at the bottom. I was so surprised to watch Diamant's to notice a pretty lacking romantic energy since he was one of the eight characters who was supposed to be romanceable, but it felt lacking. I felt like it could have been an issue with voice directing, however he seemed to be more dedicated to fighting alongside Aaliyah than loving him. It's even a ring exchange, he melted down a ring passed down generationally in his royal family, but his delivery just felt so platonic. But if you love Diamant, I can see how you could enjoy this ending. Now, Zelkov was not listed as a romantic character, but watching his S rank right after Diamant's felt pretty jarring since it seemed like it could easily be seen as romantic in comparison. The highlight of it is him breaking his unusual pattern of speaking just for Alir and essentially requesting for him to join him in his pursuit to find purpose in life. The delivery felt incredibly intimate, and his gifting Alir a necklace that has each stone representing an aspect of his affection for him felt almost unforgivably romantic. And I was so mad when Figado was not on the list of romanceable characters, but his flirty disposition meant that I never felt too robbed. Similar to Diamant, his feels very dedicated allies in war and just more platonic, but the fact that he kisses a pact ring before going into battle and blushes a little in his picture means there definitely is some romance you can derive from this conversation. The characters who seemed just a little bit off being definitely romantic are Boucheron and Alcarist. Until I watched Boucheron's S rank, I had convinced myself that he was a romantic option, and I always forget he wasn't supposed to be. And while his conversation is definitely a little more comedic, there is definitely at least some romance there. It started feeling like Aaliyah's feelings for Boucheron were a little one-sided, but when Boucheron says he is in the same mind as Aaliyah and wants to follow him to the ends of the earth, it feels a little hard to say no homo. And for Alchrist, beating out his older brother, he gives Aaliyah a gemstone entrusted by his father, which he thinks matches Aaliyah. He treasures it as a generational heirloom, but he trusts Aaliyah is important enough to gift it to. This is pretty similar to Diamant, but the delivery and tone just felt significantly more intimate. It could just be his personality, but Alchrist blushing and his dedication and Aaliyah's energy too just made it a lot easier to read as romantic. Finally, for the seven romantic options, all being from the original list of eight, with Diamant being the only one who missed out, there is Alfred, Louis, Kagetsu, Brunet, Pandreo, Seidel, and also Movia, who felt a little on the brink, but still definitely romantic. I'm not going to go into detail on all of these, but I'll mention some highlights. Out of all the male options, Alfred and Kagetsu are the only character to say that they love Aaliyah, with others saying things along the line of adoring or cherishing. However, I don't think this being missing for the others makes them not romantic. Also, on the note of Alfred and spoilers for his epilogue, I was so mad that his non-romantic epilogue describes him dying after a short reign, but if you romance him, this is not the case. So no pressure, but if you want Alfred to enjoy a long and happy life, you have to marry him. But with how sweet his conversation was, that wasn't really too much of a sacrifice. Also, sometime before I played Engage, I saw a couple of people saying that you cannot romance Pandreo if you're playing as male Aaliyah since he's essentially a Catholic priest. So imagine my shock when he admits his adoration for Aaliyah and how precious he is to him with feelings that can't be forbidden or denied. Louis' romance was also very sweet, but I also enjoy the easter egg of male Aaliyah and Louis' voice actors actually being married in real life, adding a cute extra dimension to their romance in Engage. Also, I want to highlight Bunet as a character I chose. I don't know why for sure, maybe it's a silly hair, maybe the jabot, maybe it's him being himbo adjacent, but he was my pick. I like how he incorporated his love of cooking into his admission of love without it being too gimmicky. Seeing this fully voice acted admission of love between two male characters in a first party Nintendo game with them calling each other beautiful and wanting to be partners forever was definitely a surreal experience. Looking through the female S rank supports really made me feel like I missed out on a lot in Engage. If only I wasn't boyfriend shopping for Aaliyah the whole time, I might not have accidentally ended up doing a misogyny run and missing out on so many well written female characters. It's always a bittersweet experience missing out on characters you might like in a Fire Emblem game, but either way, let's put them on the sapphic scale. 
For the purely platonic tier, there are all the young female characters, being Fram, Anna, Hortensia, and Vale. Anna's conversation about her business aspirations is really sweet. On the other hand, unfortunately, Fram solidified her as probably my least favourite playable character. I am sorry, Fram Nation. And in a refreshing break from tradition, Vale, spoilers, Alia's younger sister, is not romanceable. How scandalous. For the characters who female Alia seemed to have a pretty one-sided attraction to, there was only really Etie. It felt pretty similar to Amber, where the main character's affections are clearly going over the other character's head. Like, Etie essentially friendzones Alia as a training partner, but at least they don't seem that torn up about it. Now for the characters who have a one-sided attraction to Alia, I chose Citrine and Sapphire. Both of these surprised me for different reasons. Citrine was supposed to be one of the canon romantic options, so it was pretty sad to see her affection for Alia seem pretty one-sided. Alia literally called the Pact Ring a token of her friendship, and my heart broke a little for Citrine hearing that. And with Sapphire, whose conversation was arguably a bit more romantic coded than Citrine's in spite of the obvious age difference, it seemed a little more mutual. However, the delivery did make it seem like Safia was a bit happier than Alia. For the potentially romantic female options, there is Tamara and Saline. With Saline, it felt a little bit like an A-rank conversation, but with a pact ring, just a little pre-romantic. But getting to see the responsible side of Saline's character was refreshing, since I didn't use her much, and with Tamara, there was just a little bit too much talk of friendship for it to be any higher, but all the talk of hearts being connected means I could definitely justify it being at least a little coded. Both Jade and Yunaka were so close to being completely romantic, but with the other choices in the top tier, I placed them here for the sake of distinction. Yunaka's conversation really reminded me of Zelkov's as how much character development you get in the s rank conversation, but it felt a little too one-sided until the end, when it was clear that some kind of feelings were reciprocated. And for Jade, the conversation had some very heavy romantic undertones, but the language was just a little bit too vague for me to put it in the top tier, which is a shame since she was one of the apparent romance options as well. However, if you were to choose either Yunaka or Jade as a romance option, you wouldn't be disappointed. Finally, for the definitely romantic options, there are Chloe, Lapis, Ivy, Merin, Panette, and Goldberry, with Panette maybe being a bit on the lower end, but still definitely romantic. After watching all the S-rank conversations, I definitely was the most disappointed that I didn't use Merin or Lapis at all. Their relationship with Aaliyah seemed very genuine, and the explicit expression of adoration in their S-rank conversations was incredibly heartwarming. If I had to pick just one for if slash when I replay engage, I feel like Merrin might just clinch it. The way the romantic intentions are revealed through the draft of her book made me mourn benching her. This was of course just my opinion on the S-rank conversations in the English dub of engage, but with something as subjective as this dialogue, I doubt that my interpretation was universal, so if you had a different interpretation of any of these scenes, make sure to tell me. Compared to prior entries where the main character wasn't voiced, having Alia voiced in these conversations does a lot to flesh out the relationships they have with the other characters. And I've already mentioned it a couple of times, especially when referencing the relationship between Alia and Louis' voice actors, but having fully spoken romantic same-sex dialogue with multiple options too in a Nintendo game feels unreal and helps with humanising the queerness present and engage. However, this romance and representation is not without critique. A lot of players have mentioned that queerness is not being mentioned at all, with s rank conversations having identical scripts whether you're playing as male or female Aaliyah. Now, I could argue that the world of Fire Emblem Engage could just be completely accepting of same-sex relationships, so that's why it's not addressed. But I don't want to get too deep into hypotheticals. And as I've referenced, some of the romantic conversations seem to come out of nowhere when compared to a rank conversations that come before them. However, this is definitely on a case-by-case -case basis. Some characters' conversations seem very naturally progressed from the previous one, while others do seem to come a bit out of nowhere. And when looking back at the tier ranking, there are some discrepancies with the characters who were listed as romantic options before the game was released, but ended up not fulfilling this, especially when looking at Citrine getting friendzoned and Diamond's no homo ring exchange. But even with these drawbacks, I see the romance and engage as a net positive, especially when compared to previous entries in the series. So, where do these games stand in comparison? I think the best way to get a grasp of the trajectory of queer representation in Fire Emblem pre-engage is to go back to the beginning and work our way to engage from the start. At least that's what I would do if I was more familiar with the earlier games. However, I would be completely clueless if it weren't for tools like the Compendium of Queer Content in the Fire Emblem series, as well as a slightly less intense but still useful article by Pink News on the series. 
Both of these resources especially were amazing for contextualizing the history Fire Emblem has as queer representation, especially when you're exploring subtext. There are pairings like Marty and Dagda, Joshua and Garrick, Florina and Lynn, and Lucius and Raven, all of which in games which are less accessible but easy to interpret as queer coded. With how it was becoming more and more common for queer relationships to have to be canon to be accepted, it is easy to overlook our roots. For centuries, queer relationships have had to be hidden in plain sight for those who want to see it through subtext. And this is still common in media where more explicit representation can be polarizing, like video games. Now, I've already discussed subtext in length in my JoJo video, but when it comes to queer representation, overlooking subtext is overlooking what is inherently queer. I'm not going to talk about these older games too much since there is simply too much to discuss, but I want to acknowledge them for the foundations they laid for consistent queer coding throughout most of the Fire Emblem series. It wasn't always there, but it is ignorant to assume, as I did before researching, that queer representation in Fire Emblem is a recent phenomenon. If you do want to learn more about representation in the older games, I heavily recommend the two sources I just mentioned. So the first game I want to discuss is actually argued by some to be the best queer representation in the franchise. It is forgotten by some and dismissed by others as not real representation, but it would be a miss to overlook Radiant Dawn and Path of Radiance. Now full disclosure, I haven't played either of these games, largely due to their inaccessibility, but they kept coming up when I was researching to the point where I felt like I would have been beating around a big gay bush if I missed them out. But like the previous section, I'm not going to discuss it too much since I mostly want to focus on the games which I've actually played, but I'll link some sources which I found useful when researching this duology. The main reason why these games are heralded for having such good representation is because of the relationship between Ike and Sorin, and to a lesser extent Ranulf. The relationship between Ike and these characters is given a lot of attention in the main narrative, and for Sorin especially it can easily be interpreted as romantic. And on top of this, the only paired ending options for Ike and Radiant Dawn are with these two characters, and this almost mirrors some of the more ambiguously phrased romantic endings in the modern games. As well as this, there is also the fact that aside from a scene at the end of Path of Radiance which is ignored at the start of Radiant Dawn, Ike gives very little attention to female characters who openly try and flirt with him. The reason why this version of queer representation is liked by some Fire Emblem fans is that it's not optional content and is a core part of the characterization of the main cast. Before Engage, the closest we had gotten to queer main characters is Edelgard's optional route in Free Houses, but other than this it has largely been side characters. So these two, much earlier games stand out for how they handle this subtextual relationship. This is not the only reason why the games that take place in Tellius are seen as having good representation. There is Kaiser, who is one of the earliest gender neutral Fire Emblem characters, which is reinforced by the neutral pronouns used for them in the mobile game. They are shown to have a strong affection for Ranulf as well. And there is also Heather, who is seen as the earliest canonically gay character in Fire Emblem. The duology also has a strong focus on going against discrimination as a theme, so acknowledging all of this you can understand why overlooking the queerness of these games would have felt a bit criminal. Like many fans, Awakening was my formal introduction to Fire Emblem. As a game, I loved it, it blossomed my appreciation for the series and is why I'm invested in it today, but as a fag, not so much. This was a game that brought marriage, relationships, and breeding child soldiers to the forefront of Fire Emblem, and a casualty of that was a queer representation. Of course, there are fans who see certain characters as potentially queer, with pairings like Male Male Crobin still having a following. But when looking just at Awakening, the game, it's a little more dire. Of course, there is the obvious with there being no same gender romance options. Even though the gender difference between male and female Robin has very little bearing on the narrative, it still limits you from half the romance options in the game. As a baby gay playing Awakening, it felt a little hostile, but I guess it's just a sign of the time it released, so I chose Cordelia to be my beard and I fathered Severa and Morgan in a passionless marriage. But it's not just the lack of romance options that alienated queer Fire Emblem fans, but also the treatment of queerness in the narrative. There is a DLC called Harvest Scramble, which I've never played, but apparently has some queer baity content, especially surrounding characters like Sumia and Sully. But at the same time, there are multiple instances where queerness is made the butt of the joke, like the support between female Robin and Flavia. And another thing which people see as related to the antithesis of queerness in Awakening, but is actually related to the Radiant duology, is Priam. He is an additional character from a bonus level who is hinted to have some relation to Ike, or at least a resemblance. There are debates around whether he is actually a descendant of Ike or not, but a lot of people see Priam as evidence of Ike's straightness. I mean, you can take it or leave it, but I don't really agree with seeing one obscure character from Awakening as disproving games worth of subtext for a duology that preceded it by more than half a decade. But if you subscribe to this, then power to you. But taking all of this into account, the lack of any gay options, a queer baity DLC, the potential implications of Priam, it paints a relatively damning picture for Awakening. 
is still a great game which holds a place in my heart, but it also does nothing for Fire Emblem in terms of representation. Now, from absolutely nothing to at least something, but should that something exist, uh... Let's start with the positives. Fates is the first game in the series to include a canonical same-sex romance choice. There are two. Niles is a male option, who is only available in the conquest route, and then there's Rajat, who is the female option, and only available in the birthright route. She's also one of the child characters, so you have to go to the effort of making Hayato birth her first. Essentially, Fire Emblem gay version and Fire Emblem lesbian version. When it was announced that these games would be having same-sex options, I was excited, since after Awakening showed no signs of ever including anything like this, I felt like they were going above and beyond. But looking back at it, it really is the bare minimum, and the choice for Niles and Rajat to be the only same-sex options is questionable. I liked Niles, and was happy to choose him as my S-rank when playing through Fates, but in retrospect, having the first ever canon Fire Emblem bisexual man be a hypersexualized sadomasochist when stereotypes like this are what perpetuates a lot of homophobia is less than ideal, and having Rajat be creepy and obsessive also isn't a great look for the first sapphic romance option either. While both of these characters have their fans, and I still have a soft spot for Niles, what they represent is pretty disliked, and it starts a trend of some characters being chosen to be same-sex love interests for the main character, but having almost identical support conversations compared to a hetero version of the support. This is why it's a little frustrating it took them until Engage to just unlock it all, instead of making arbitrary choices about which characters are same-sex options, because the choice of just Niles and just Rajat is regrettable. Now, if this was the only questionable queer aspect of Fates, then that would be one thing, but there is another aspect that made headlines when the game initially released in Japan. Essentially, every character has to be romanceable by the main character in Fates, if it's straight of course, and this includes characters like Soleil. She is seen to be incredibly attracted to and open about her admiration of the other female characters, and is shown to have a distaste for the male characters with a form of androphobia. She is even titled Girl Lover in some of the promotion material. But of course, she has to be a romance option for the male main character. Of course, not any female characters, that would be ridiculous. So, how do they achieve this? In the Japanese release, male Corrin puts a magic powder in Soleil's drink that lets her see Corrin as a woman, and he uses this to build a connection with her. By the time they make it to S rank, she loves him as a man, and they get married, and she essentially renounces attraction to anyone else. This is obviously interpreted by many fans as non-consensual drugging and a form of conversion therapy. While there is a little more nuance to this, with an article going in-depth translating all of her support conversations, this interpretation caught on like wildfire, to the point where Nintendo had to make a statement saying they were taking the conversion therapy out of the game upon localization. But even with this, Fates is now stained with the reputation of the game with the questionable gay characters and the conversion therapy drugging. And it's also worth noting that there is a character Forrest, who is presented as a male character with a taste for feminine clothing. There is a debate around whether this is hinting that they could be a trans woman or trans femme, and a similar debate has resurfaced with Rosado and Engage. Some say these characters are clearly hinted at being trans women based on some of their narrative theming and their designs, while others call the assumption regressive, and this only makes assumptions that men cannot have feminine tastes without being secretly trans. This isn't as controversial as, say, the Soleil situation, but it's cause for some contention with the fans and is definitely worth mentioning. So while the Fates games technically have more canon representation than the Radiance games, which are mainly subtext, you can see why the representation in this game is really not that well regarded. While it was definitely Nintendo making a step with what they will allow, most players agree that this step was definitely in the wrong direction. Following a misguided step, echoes can be seen as course correction. Even if the representation is pretty minor, it's generally pretty well liked. If you have forgotten about Echoes like I occasionally do, it's a 2017 remake and reimagining of Fire Emblem Gaiden, which features new gameplay features and my favourite art style the series has featured to date. With all of the modernizations that came with the game 25 years after the original, this meant that the cast got a lot more characterization than they had originally. And one of these characters is Leon, who is shown to be explicitly gay. He is shown to shut down the advances of women and explicitly says he prefers the company of men. When he thinks Kamui is flirting with him, he expresses his affection for Valbar, and unlike some more subtextual representations, little is left up to the imagination. He's just gay. While his affection for Valbar is one-sided, and while Echoes does not feature any romance, it is nice to see a character actually written to be gay, instead of capable of just being a same-sex romance option. I think this helps Echoes stand above a game like Engage in some respects, and definitely above something like Fates. Instead of sexuality being a mechanic, it's actually a written-in aspect of his personality. 
It's a common rhetoric in certain circles that sexuality shouldn't define a character or even draw too much attention, but you also hear this from people who say queer representation needs to make sense and you can't just have it where it doesn't fit. It's almost like with some people you can't win when it comes to queer representation. It's almost like some people just don't want to see it. But with a character like Leon, it's good to see that while his sexuality does define a certain part of his character, it's not all of it. And that, to me, is a sign of good character writing. Moving to the last game preceding Engage, there is 2019's Free Houses. When this game was being teased and announced, Fates was still fresh to me, and I pretty ignorantly held its representation in high regard. I assumed that the representation would get better, so I was looking forward to having more options. So when I found out what the options were, it was dire enough for me to want to skip it. This is kind of weird, since it is a step up from Fates. Instead of there just being two s rank same-sex options, there were eight, with five female and three male but the closer you look into it, the worse it gets. First, the female options. Out of the five romantic options, Mercedes and Dorothea were praised for being good romantic same-sex options, with Dorothea especially being praised for having her bisexuality be represented not just in her S rank with Byleth, but Sophus, while definitely having romantic attraction, appears to be pretty young looking in spite of being one of the appears to be young but is actually immortal characters and some players found this off-putting, but some others didn't. Then with Rhea, it's romantic, but her weird relationship with Byleth and essentially having more of a familial connection made it kind of weird. And while Edelgard was praised as being a same-sex main character option, some fans complained about the language and her S rank being a little too ambiguous, and not as explicitly romantic as fans would have liked. If we're going with my engaged tier ranking from earlier, it would definitely be somewhere between romantic coded and likely romantic but the male options also gained quite a bit of attention. Linhart is a good S rank and explicitly states his romantic attraction, but then there are the other two options. Both Gilbert and Aloise's S ranks are explicitly platonic, leaving Linhart as the only male same-sex option at launch. This of course gained a lot of negative traction, and I think it's deserved, mainly because teasing players is a choice of more options, just for two-thirds of them to actually not be romantic at all, sucks. But don't worry, this was fixed. Kind of with DLC. Paid DLC. Both Yuri and Juritsa were added as extra male same-sex options, and they are liked by fans, with Yuri's route especially being well regarded. However, does it not feel like a bit of a slap in the face to want more than the bare minimum representation and being told you have to pay a premium for it? Tell me, young man, have you ever heard the term gay for pay? So yes, at the time of release, mechanically, Free Houses gave you the most same-sex options, but if you compare this to the Radiance games having a great subtextual approach to representation, or even Leon in Echoes just being gay without feeling like he's filling out a quota, then consider the mixed bag of female options and how two-thirds of the actually romantic male options are hidden behind a paywall, you can understand why some Fire Emblem fans were less than pleased with Free Houses. After exploring the games that proceed Engage, I think we can clearly assess what it did well and what it didn't. It improves upon Fates and Free Houses by ridding the franchise of arbitrarily chosen queer options, and after doing this, I think it would be hard for them to go back, and that's progress. But you could argue that it should include more representations of queerness outside of romance, with characters like Leon, or potential queerness included in the main plot, like the relationship between Ike and Soren. However, I can't help but feel like Engage wasn't the game for that. While Aaliyah has the option to romance a character in Engage, it feels less like a feature and more like honouring series tradition. The romance has very little bearing on the plot, but otherwise, most character supports are platonic. Like with how no side characters can be paired off, love just isn't really in the air much in Engage, and that's fine. For example, I'm sure aromantic Fire Emblem fans are refreshed with how little of a bearing romance holds in this game compared to prior entries. So while yes, I'm sure Engage could have done more to represent queer fans, however, if it did, it might have simply been too transformative. So, for what Engage is, I think the options it gives queer players are more than adequate. So as I mentioned in the introduction, Nintendo has a pretty murky history when it comes to queer representation. There are some examples. Vivian and Birdo from the Mario franchise are trans, Toad is agender, Tony from Earthbound is gay, Isabel from Animal Crossing is pan, Girahim and Bolson from Zelda are also seen by some fans as gay. But with all of these examples, they are pretty incidental and, few and far between, literally spread over decades and also none of these are particularly great forms of representation. Vivian and Birdo are both frequently misgendered when their trans identity is revealed, 
and Toad was only really made a gender to stop people shipping them was Toadette. Tony is an incredibly minor character in Earthbound, and Isabel is only seen as Pan because she has a very subtle crush on the mayor no matter what their gender is. With Girahim and Bolson, these characters aren't even canon, just assumptions based on stereotypes. And this is not to take away from people that love these characters and what they represent, but it is hard to argue that any of them are perfect representations of the groups they are just incidentally representing. The first chance Nintendo had to explicitly represent queer gamers was Tomodachi Life, which was also completely missed. Nintendo created a big controversy by excluding the option for same-sex couples from the now cult classic. They even doubled down by patching out a bug which would let this be possible. They did apologise for this a while later and promised to do better, but they also claimed it would be impossible to patch same-sex relationships in, which is honestly an awful excuse when some players managed to achieve this accidentally. But something has changed with Nintendo since then, and the main place this can be seen is in the Fire Emblem series, which has progressed with its queer representation until we have gotten to the point where we have engaged today. Nintendo has also voiced more explicit support in recent years. Just last year, when the Japanese Supreme Court rejected a proposal for same-sex marriage, Nintendo, without prompting, made a statement saying they will give their employees in same-sex relationships the same workplace rights as straight ones. It is of course worth clarifying that Fire Emblem is developed by Intelligent Systems and not Nintendo EAD. However, it is still published as a first-party Nintendo game and is under the bracket of an exclusively Nintendo IP. Engage is not perfect representation, but I do think it's symbolic of a Nintendo that is aiming to be more inclusive. It is also a reminder that the Fire Emblem series will always be where Nintendo are able to represent underrepresented groups due to the large casts of characters these games include. Because of this, they are worth keeping an eye on to get an indication of the developer's intentions. Whether it is some developers having a subtextual influence in the older games, the complete lack of consideration in Awakening, the confused representation in Fates, or the growth in choices between free houses and engage. The representation in the Fire Emblem series still has room for improvement, but when we are looking at its history, it is easier to appreciate the steps which are being made. If you've made it to the end, thank you so much for sticking about. If you like hearing me talk about queer subtext and just queer relationships where they may not be recognised by a lot of people, I'd recommend my JoJo video. It's where I got a lot of the foundation of knowledge which I used in this video about queer subtext and it's a lot more in-depth, but I think it's still interesting, especially if you care about JoJo or are just mildly interested. And if you like conversations about drama in video games, like all the stuff with Fates, then I'd recommend one of my two Bayonetta videos. I'm pretty happy with them. Um, but yeah, and if you like video essay style videos like this, then subscribing would be amazing. This is kind of the stuff which I do. I got more content like this planned. I'm not sure if it's all going to be about Fire Emblem, but yeah, no, I'm happy to get all the enjoyment I had with Engage out of my system, and yeah, no, I really loved it, honestly. Um, but yeah, before I go into some more notes I had about the video, I got some thank yous. Annie, of course, always helps me look over the scripts, and they make them so much more coherent and concise, and yeah, I'm really happy with how the draft which I ended up using of this turned out. Also, thank you, Sararon Art, who is also on YouTube, and they gave me some amazing advice, mainly with like video production ideas, but also some stuff as a script, which has really helped it turn out as well as I'm happy it did. And also, Jay and Seb helped me look over the final product as well and gave me some pointers, and I'm really happy with how it's all come together. But yeah, just some notes about the video. I, of course, as I mentioned throughout the video, have some ignorance when it comes to the Fire Emblem series, just as the games which I haven't been able to play, but I just felt like I would have been overlooking a lot if I didn't mention them. But yeah, like, <laughs> a main example of my ignorance is that I completely forgot about Free Hopes, the spin-off for Free Houses. Like, there is apparently some queer representation in there which I'd just completely missed. But yeah, I actually made a post on Reddit a few days ago after the first draft was finished, and I got some really good feedback, so I'll link that if you want to see some more discussion about the queer representation in the series. If you want to learn more about the queer representation in the series, I strongly recommend going to the, um, the queer compendium for the series. It was such a good source, it was so easy to work with. Also, I feel like I should clarify, I do like Forrest and Rosado. I brought them up in a very ambiguous way. It's been ages since I played Fate, so I can't remember exactly how I feel about Forrest, but I like his design, and Rosado was one of my favourite characters in Engage. Just, yeah, the way they were characterised was so fun, and it really helped them stand out. Um, but yeah, also, talking about stuff which I didn't really get a chance to elaborate on too much, was the extra queer representation with Nintendo. Nintendo has so many franchises, and there's always more than you initially consider, and Sararon especially gave me some great extra ideas of Nintendo representation, which 
I tried to fit in, but a lot of it I couldn't. But yeah, there is a lot more which I just didn't have a chance to go over, especially if you start looking into subtext. But I think that's everything I have to say. I have actually, I've put all my videos into playlists, so if you just want to look at videos about gaming, for example, it's all sorted. But yeah, check those out if you want an easy way to get through my quite limited content, but it's more there as like a future thing. But yeah, no, also thanks for your response to my last video, it was absolutely amazing compared to, obviously it wasn't that much in the grand scheme, but compared to my other videos, the response I got was absolutely amazing, and yeah, no, I'm really happy with how it turned out, and yeah, no, any feedback you have about this video, any other videos I have, I always want to see it, so yeah, thanks for watching.